Okay, so the last lesson we looked at the uh, the different types of markets within the uh, economic system. So remember, we work in a, a mixed economy, but there are different types of markets, such as perfectly competitive markets, monopolies, monopolistic competition, and ogolopolies. And then within those types of markets, there are different types of businesses that operate. Okay, so let's look at our business types. So within the different types of markets, there are just different types of businesses. Uh, we're going to have four primary models that we're really going to look at. One is a sole proprietorship. One is a partnership, corporation, and then a franchise. And these are all things you're very familiar with, you see on a daily basis. We just kind of want to define them out so that way we can differentiate how they work. So within those types are business models that slightly differentiate themselves from one another. So the first we want to look at is a sole proprietorship. So the simplest form of business type where a firm is owned and managed by a single individual. So sole proprietorship, all costs and profits are your responsibility. The key point here is going to be that even though you're making all the money, you also are, are footing all of the costs. And that's going to be a big deal uh, in terms of how we look at the difference between these different types of businesses is who's actually up for paying for these costs. So obviously they can be very easy to start and they do not have to employ very many people. The majority of businesses in a city are sole proprietorships. We'll look at numbers here in a second. And the number of employees can vary greatly within a sole proprietorship, literally from having none at all to having hundreds of them. You know, you think, for example, as simple as a lemonade stand, that is a sole proprietorship. So sole proprietorships make up 74% of American companies well, only 19% of companies are corporations. So when you look at this share of companies up here, you'll notice you see these four different colors. Reality, though, we're talking about corporations being two different, so there's S and C. So when we talk about corporations, we'll talk about the difference. But understand, when we refer to corporations, we're referring to both together. So that's 19% versus the 74% of sole proprietorships. Or if you look at generated revenues, you see that sole proprietorships account for 5% of sales. Whereas uh, corporations account for 84%. So those overwhelmingly, when you talk about it, you know, even though the majority of companies are sole proprietorships, they don't make all that much revenue in terms of the share of sales within the United States. Corporations do that. And it's understandable why you would see that with corporations like Apple and Microsoft and these other corporations developed. So this is why sole proprietorships are often referred to as small businesses, because they're not that large. These aren't profit generating monsters like Apple and other corporations, but that doesn't mean of course they don't make profit. Obviously they generate 5% of the profit, but they make up 74% of the type of business, businesses we see here within the United States. Okay, so let's look at the primary advantages to having a sole proprietorship. The first is that it's easy to start. I mean, when you think about the lemonade stand, for example, there's minimum expense, Government paperwork is small in order to actually start a small business. Usually you're filing for a license and permits and those are for tax purposes. There's a few government regulations um, of primary concern is maintaining accurate financial records and complying with federal employment laws. But outside of that, you have a lot of leeway. Now, you have 100% complete control because you are the boss, you make the decisions. As the owner, you keep all the profits and you only share profits appropriately if you want to. That would be, of course, with employees. You have lower taxes. Income from sole proprietorship is taxed only once. Now, this is really, really important to understand. Okay, it's only taxed once as the owner's personal income. Now, understand that income from a sole proprietorship is taxed as the personal income. There's also pride of ownership. We don't really need to talk about that. And then there are also, of course, some significant disadvantages. Um, you have unlimited personal liability and responsibility. So just a second ago when I emphasized the income tax, this is also this. Liability is a legal obligation to pay any debts of the business. As a sole proprietorship, you are responsible for 100% of the responsibility and liability. So just as you make all the profits and just as you only get it counted once on your income tax, you also have responsibility for everything that the cost and debts of that business incur. So a sole proprietor, your liability extends to your personal wealth to cover any debts by the business. That is a massive difference in the way you'll see how corporations are ranking. Sole proprietors also have sole responsibility to manage all aspects of the business. And that, we're talking about individuals who may or may not 
have experience with managing all aspects. It's also difficult to raise financial capital. And when we looked at that investment as the owner of a sole proprietor, there's not a where you can just go out and just raise financial capital. It's much more difficult. Banks are also hesitant to loan money sometimes with unless you have a track record of success. There's a limited life to the proprietorship simply because there's a limited life to you unless you are leaving that business to someone else. A lot of times when people die, their businesses die with them. So the business could be sold or transferred, but then it would be a new firm. There's also difficulty finding and keeping good workers. Fact of the matter is, sole proprietorships have difficulty with employees for numerous reasons, one of which is once they become greatly skilled, they move on to more higher paying jobs. They have trouble paying them large amounts, providing health care, business may not be permanent. Like we said, once they're highly trained, they'll leave for better employment. Now our second business model is a partnership. So partnerships fall into two broad categories. There's a general partnership and then there's a limited partnership. General partnerships, very common, partner share responsibility in all aspects of the business. So they share the liability and responsibility of running it. Now limited on the other hand involves a general partner who's running everything like a sole proprietorship would. And they're responsible for the business but there's a limited partner who usually is the financial backer, somebody behind the scenes who's helping pay for this part, this proprietorship to be in, to run. And the limited partner can only lose the amount of money they invest. They have limited liability here. So for every dollar they put in, that is the absolute most they're going to lose. So if they invest $100,000, the most they're going to lose is $100,000. Now, from a perspective, when we were looking earlier at size of the market, partnerships only account for about 6% of all business in the U.S., but account for 11% of the revenue. So once you start to add people, what you'll notice, of course, is as you add people into the business, you notice that the percentage of revenues increase. So on average, partnerships generate 6% more revenue than sole proprietorships. So when you look at the share of the companies, this is your partnership, 6%. But when you look at the share of sales, you'll notice it's 11%. So in other words, as you add individuals, you're actually, what you're doing really is you're adding the ability to acquire capital, financial capital, and thus that raises your ability to generate total revenue. Now, of course, you gotta remember that total revenue, once it becomes profit, is being split between those partners in some fashion. So what are the advantages to having a partnership? Um, they're easy to start, as with sole proprietorships. Partnerships, of course, they're easy to develop. Primary difference, of course, being determining who's, who's handling what responsibilities and all that would, of course, entail also percentage of profit. So this can either be done through good faith or far, far, far more important through legal agreements. There's few government regulations um, still looking at accurate tax records, following employment laws, those are your primary responsibilities. Um, there is a shared decision making, but that also generates increased specialization because each partner has a different set of skills they're able to bring in. Now this can be a positive and a negative. Uh, there's a greater ability to raise financial capital because like we said, when you, in, when you increase the number of people within the company, within your proprietorship, that means that you're able to increase the amount of capital available. So partnerships are more able to secure loans because of the secure the shared responsibility as well. And sometimes that's why you see these limited partnerships developing because you get these financial backers who are able to acquire the loans for the sole proprietor. At the same time, partnerships have a greater ability to attract and retain workers. Um, that, a lot of that is because of course the acquisition of capital and thus the ability to pay them or also, or also the possibility of making them a partner within the company itself. Um, lower taxes, of course. Partners pay personal income taxes on their share of the income, just like sole proprietors do. Now, disadvantages, though. Uh, unlimited personal li liability, again, just like you had with a sole proprietorship, we're talking about unlimited personal liability. There's a limited life of the business, once again. For the business to continue, uh, must be able to transition between partners. That's going to take legal agreements in a lot of cases. Uh, you have disagreements. Partners are going to disagree. Uh, and so if they're not able to come to a consensus, business can stall. Profits must be shared. That is a disadvantage. Obviously, if you're looking to make the greatest possible amount of money, those profits aren't necessarily even either. You may have a 60-40 agreement, 70-30. It's not necessarily going to be 50-50. 
Okay, corporations. Now, while corporations may not be the largest percentage of business market, they are obviously the most well-known and, of course, the, the, the business type that garners the most profit. So corporations are the most well-known type of business model, and it's primarily because of the revenue they generate. The reason why you know names like Coke, Microsoft, Apple, these types of places because of the marketing and the revenues they generate. For my pie chart, the pie charts we use, the corporations account for 19% of companies when S and C are combined. So we notice, you know, S and C, the 6 and 13%. But when we look at the share of sales, of course, now we're talking about a significant portion here. I mean, the overwhelming proportion of our revenues generated within our economy come from these two types of corporations. So they're responsible for 84% of sales. So when you think about Apple, Pepsi, Microsoft, Google, these are companies that are generating the high revenues within the United States economic markets. So what is a corporation? And then of course, why CNS? So corporations are a legal entity that are protected by the Constitution like people. 14th Amendment actually gives protection not just to people, but it also gives protection to corporations. They are treated like individuals. So they can gain or lose money, but they can also be sued and convicted of crimes. And of course, that's something we see often in the news. So in S corporations, these are ones that do not pay any federal income taxes. Instead, the corporation's income and losses are passed on to the shareholders who report that on their income. So when you think of an S corporation, think of that like a sole proprietorship in terms of who actually pays taxes. So S corporations see taxes paid by the individuals who are members of the corporation, the shareholders whereas C corporations are taxed separately. Now the overwhelming majority of corporations are C corporations. Um, and that is uh, simply because of the fact of how they're structured. C corporations allow shareholders moving in and out. It doesn't deal with the income tax and the same thing. So it's, it's much more efficient in how it's ran. So we can kind of look at it like this. Corporation files an application to create a corporation called an article of incorporation. So in order to become a corporation, they have to file an application. If it's granted, they're ex um, they then create a charter, which is a legal authorization to form a corporation. Then a board of directors is elected by the stockholders to oversee the company, which is ran by the executives hired by the board. So stockholders are buying stock. That gives them partial ownership of the company. They select a board of directors whose responsibility is to pick the individuals who actually run the day-to-day -day operations of the company. And then profits from the firm are then divided among the stockholders based on the percentage of stock they own. This is called the dividend. And the key is that you can only lose what you invest. So if you own 23% of the stock in that company, then when the profits come out, you're going to gain 23% of the profits. Of course, in order to control the corporation, you only need to control 51% of the stock because then that would give you majority control. And that's how corporations work is with this majority control on the board. Okay, corporations are unique and that they're multinational. They operate globally. So when you look at these companies here, and you've seen these names before, some of these you probably haven't, but what you need to understand is these are global. Nissan, for example, is very well known because Nissan, Nissan's North American headquarters are here in Tennessee. They've got a factory there at Smyrna. Nissan, of course, is a Japanese company. These are multinational. They operate across multiple borders. And so it, from a, a legal perspective, you can imagine trying to deal with these. Now they can either be private corporations in which only select individuals own stock. Now these corporations are usually family owned. Stock passes from generation to generation. Or you can have publicly traded corporations and have shareholders who can number in the millions. For example, you look at Apple, you look at Coca-Cola, you look at HP, you look at these where people can buy stock, public stock. Anyone can buy it and become a shareholder within the company. So anyone can buy and sell their stocks and they're publicly traded in stock exchanges like those on Wall Street. However, there's a common misperception. Publicly traded corporations account for less than 1% of all corporations. It's just that they're so massive. So if you want to build a corporation, a multinational corporation, and you want that corporation to be huge in terms of revenues, then obviously publicly trading it is the way to go because those are the names you recognize. And the reason why is because of the fact that they can issue stock numerous times and that's how they can build their financial capital because every time you buy stock, you're basically giving them your money 
for them to invest in financial growth. So that's that investment process. Okay, so what are the advantages of corporations? Um, it's easier to raise financial capital. That's become obvious because the sale of stock allows them to become shareholders, promises future profits. Uh, for the corporation, it provides large sums of money for various purposes. Um, that could be to build a factory, that could be, you know, there's different things that they're doing. Um, th limited liability is a major, major part of this corporate growth. And that's because you're only gonna lose the money you've invested. So if you invested $100,000 in Apple, 10 years ago. Well, for one, you're rich. Number two, if Apple were to collapse, the most you were going to lose is that money you initially invested. The, the company itself may lose billions of dollars, but you would only lose the money you initially invested. That's the most you're going to lose. There's also unlimited life. Corporations continue to exist regardless of who joins or leaves because of the fact that you have that board of directors who is, who is hiring individuals to work within the company. And that's why you see the specialized management. As the directors, uh, the board of directors, what they do is they hire individuals who specialize in simply running the corporation. So it's ran by experts who should be able to make correct decisions. Now we know of course that doesn't always happen, but that's what they're hired to do. Now from a disadvantaged perspective, uh, they're difficult. They're costly to start. You can imagine the amount of money it's cost to start a corporation. There's a huge amount of paperwork and costs associated because of the fact that they're treated as individuals under the 14th Amendment. They're highly regulated. Publicly traded corporations have to issue financial reports every three months, Securities and Exchange Commission, they regulate stock trades. They are very, very scrutinized legally to make sure they are staying within the boundaries established by the Securities and Exchange Commissions and the federal government. You see double taxation. Corporations pay taxes on their earnings, but at the same time, stockholders pay taxes on the earnings they receive from stock ownership. So that $100,000 you invested in Apple, you're gonna pay a tax on that. And the corporation itself pays a tax on their earnings. Now the last of our four business types is a franchise. So a franchise is, a, is an arrangement in which a person or group obtains the right to use the name and sell the products of another business. You know these all the time because you see them. Subway, Burger King, all of these different fast food places, these are franchises. So people buy the franchise from McDonald's, from KFC, from Hardee's, and so on, and then they open up that business, and it's ran by them, but it's part of a larger business model. So the advantage to franchising is that you can own your own business using a proven successful model. So you can be a sole proprietor, but you're using a business model that's established by a corporate level. So the disadvantage is that you lose control from being part of the larger corporation. So when decisions are made by McDonald's, you're expected to follow those decisions. It's not like there's a lot of decisions you have that you just can flat out say, I want to do this or do that because of the fact that you have to follow within that larger corporate business model.